Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Kunzman, Managing Editor of Contagion, and uh, I'm joined right now for a video conference interview for some uh, data that actually uh, is about 15 minutes old at the time of this discussion, at least, and uh, it's with uh, Dr. Jonathan Stern uh, from the Department of Population Health Sciences at Bristol Medical School at the University of Bristol in England. Uh, Dr. Stern is joining us right now to discuss uh, his team's newest findings regarding um, corticosteroid use in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Uh, before we get into it, first and foremost, Dr. Stern, how are you doing? Good, doing well, thank you very much. Nice to see the data uh, out there in the public at last. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's uh, much like us publishing a high stakes piece where uh, a lot of pressure around the moment of it getting up. So glad to hear it all went well. And it sounds like your discussion with JAMA went well this morning too, so. Um, <laughs> So let's go into the data itself, uh, Dr. Snare noticing here, 28-day um, uh, outcomes uh, critically improving, uh, critically ill patients with COVID-19 with systemic corticosteroid use. Can you give us a little bit more details uh, into uh, exactly the, the study makeup and what exactly this does in the implication of our treatment for critically ill COVID? Sure. So, I mean, as, as you know, and, I, and as I'm sure every, anybody watching knows, um, on the 16th of June, the recovery trial, a uh, very large trial conducting, conducted in the UK, reported its results relating to dexamethasone, a corticosteroid, and reported that dexamethasone reduced mortality overall, but particularly ill in the most severely ill patients with uh, COVID-19, those that had been invasively mechanically ventilated. Um, in fact, since April, we'd been working with WHO and the investigators of a number of trials to think about how we could combine evidence from all the trials as rapidly as possible in order to produce definitive evidence where one indi where individuals' trials might not be able to do so. So after recovery reported its results, we, uh, the, the, the trials, uh, basically, they all agreed that they could no longer... Uh, recruit patients to a no corticosteroid arm. So we agreed that we would combine all the data uh, based on patients who had been recruited to these trials up till the 9th of June, because after that time, their care might have been affected by the release of recovery results. And that we would look at 28 day mortality. So that took us to the 6th of July. So we, we, uh, we agreed that we would combine data from all the trials as soon as we could after the 6th of July. And we really engaged in a remarkable collaborative effort. So um, by the 14th of July, uh, I had outcome data from seven trials, including the recovery trial. Mm -hmm. And we had published a protocol that said how we were gonna do the analyses. And we did that before outcome data were available. And then I think between the 14th of July and the 27th of July, we analyzed the data and submitted the data to, for publication in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And at the same time, three of the trials wrote their results and also submitted papers to JAMA, and those have all been published today, along with updated international treatment guidance from the World Health Organization. And in terms of what we found, uh, broadly speaking, we found a 20% relative reduction in the risk of mortality among critically ill patients treated with corticosteroids. And we have found that the effect of dexamethasone, which we really already knew about because of recovery, uh, is consistent with the effect of hydrocortisone, which was the corticosteroid evaluated in some of the trials. So the estimated effects are similar to each other, although the number of patients randomized in trials to uh, trials of hydrocortisone is smaller, and so its effect is less precisely uh, less precisely estimated right right and and of course you use the term uh expected uh and obviously even with significant findings there is always a little bit of surprise um but obviously with our understanding of uh i guess covid 19's pathophysiology and its effect on the inflammatory systems of, among the most critically ill patients was there really, I guess, a boosted level of surprise by these findings, or is this exactly what you expected from corticosteroid use? Well, I think the release of the recovery results had given us um, an expectation or a hope that these the, 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 the findings would be replicated in these other studies. 
I mean, I think in advance of the release of recovery results, I mean, the truth is we just didn't know. I mean, some people thought that uh, corticosteroids would be beneficial because it would dampen down the hyperimmune response that seems to be causing the problems in the people who get most severely ill with COVID-19. Other people argued that this was a terrible idea and that the corticosteroids would make things worse. Um, and the principle which we all know about, and if we don't know about it, we should, is that the only way to learn about the effects of treatments is to randomize patients and find out what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I will say is that I think um, it's always desirable to replicate results of one trial in further trials. Uh, the recovery trial was a UK-based trial. These other trials have been done in a range of settings, uh, Brazil, France, China, a uh, number of countries. So we've really got absolutely clear evidence that corticosteroids reduce mortality in severely ill patients with COVID-19. Um, and I think that will allow the uh, community to go ahead. And there's now a treatment option of hydrocortisone in, in addition to dexamethasone. Right, right, absolutely. And uh, if we can expand that discussion, Dr. Stern, a little bit to real practice implication, obviously a great emphasis out of the gate for us responding to COVID-19 was assuring that uh, we had protocol and guidance set, especially for the ICU settings where we were very strained on resources and uh, things like PPE, ventilator use, uh, particularly here in the US was a great strain. I know the UK had its issues as well, of course, uh, at its peak. And um, I, I guess going forward, we're in a spot now where it certainly seems where critical and mortality risk uh, strategies are becoming more refined for this. But what exactly does this contribute, I guess, to, you know, the status of those who are still at that risk and we're still addressing right now? So I think that what this should mean is that for most patients who are severely ill with COVID-19, a corticosteroid, either dexamethasone or hydro hydrocortisone, will, will and should be uh, a, an expected component of their care, unless there's an indication because of the individual circumstances of a patient that a corticosteroid isn't appropriate. So the question from now on will be, can we identify new treatments in addition to corticosteroids that, uh, that, that reduce mortality further? Um, as I say, mortality was around 40% in these patients without a corticosteroid. It was reduced to 32% with a corticosteroid. But that still means that a very large number of these, a very high, a large number of these patients died and we need new interventions uh, to reduce that mortality further, as well as interventions uh, that can be used earlier in the course of disease yeah. when uh, corticosteroids are not appropriate. Yeah. So it, it certainly seems like we've been really improving the safety net for COVID-19, but we still need to find some more front-facing strategies and, and therapy. Right. Um, well, we only have one drug that's been shown to be effective in reducing mortality. Um, we all know that there are lots of other things that people have been talked about. Some of those, I think, have really been demonstrated now not to be effective. That includes hydroxychloroquine, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. For others, uh, the question is still open, as it is with, for example, convalescent plasma. Um, we just need to recruit patients into randomized trials uh, and, then, um, and then as rapidly as we can uh, recruit large numbers of patients. Uh, do the analyses, hopefully in a collaborative way, which is what we achieved here, and um, and then disseminate the results as quickly as possible and change the way we care for patients based on those results. Thanks, Dr. Stern. And, and uh, very lastly, uh, regarding the availability, because again, that's another discussion point that unfortunately has highlighted some of our uh, pharmacotherapy, sorry, <laughs> pharmacotherapeutic uh, responses to COVID systemic corticosteroids largely available, right? This isn't a concern where, you know, everyone should feel very well equipped and capable of uh, using this. Right. Dexamethasone uh, and hydrocortisone are available as standard in critical UK unit, uh, units across the world. They're cheap, so we haven't got any of the potential cost issues of drugs that are under patent. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, there is absolutely no obstacle to, and there's no further regulatory re approval required. There is no obstacle to their widespread use from this point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's rare to say this, but that's some great news uh, to come out of it this. It is some good news. Research. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much, Doc. I, I, I know you're stacked today. Is there anything else you'd want to add? Um, perhaps one small additional point is that some of the trials evaluated high doses of 
uh, corticosteroids. Um, there were, the numbers were not sufficient to have an answer about high versus low with any precision, but we can say that we didn't see any evidence that of greater benefit from high doses than low doses. So it's likely the low doses will be the standard of care that uh, they were used, for example, in the recovery trial. Um, and a further steroid, methylprednisolone, was evaluated, but again, the numbers were too small to evaluate its effects with precision. So we're left with uh, evidence of efficacy for dexamethasone and for hydrocortisone. And some good fodder for follow-up, as you mentioned, too. Lots of things to do, and of course, we'll be wanting to look at longer-term mortality. This was 28-day mortality. It's, of course, going to be important to understand what happens after patients are discharged from hospital. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's that's a lot more to come from there, I'm sure. So yeah. thank you so much for your time, Dr. Stern. And your Great pleasure. And congrats. Thanks for, you. On your Thanks for the invitation. Nice to talk to you. Bye.